Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you might be in the world. I was faced with, well, <laughs> what a pompous start. A um, little bit of a dilemma. It's a couple of breaking stories as we came to press, as it were, this evening. Um, the first one, regulations in the UK may change tomorrow. And the second one, DJI, had been called out yet again, uh, this by time by folks in uh, the Americas. Uh, but anyway, let's do the introductions first. There's Philip on the left, Ian, and then Daryl. And then I don't know, some bold bloke on the other side there. Uh, yeah, whoever he is. So where should we start? Where should we start? Where should we start? The reason I was going to have you on to start with, Ian, was because um, you you had a very good uh, little article about um, a 30% increase in, in drone complaints in the UK. And that then made you search out some freedom of information requests with your local police force. And from there, you generated your own stats. I've done a devil of a job of introducing that. Perhaps you'd like to unpack it better than I just managed. Yes. So, yeah, you're quite correct. Obviously, we see in the media all the time statistics about drones and why we should fear them. And always worst case scenario for anything that's ever considered about drones. Um, and obviously, I've noticed the Freedom of Information Act have been used to get police statistics. And well, I just thought, wait on a minute, this isn't, it, it just didn't strike me as, as being um, as accurate as it was being presented. I just felt, I felt fairly dismayed with my local newspaper that had got on the bandwagon they'd said there'd been 300 knock complaints. I mean, straight away, you knew that they were looking for a negative story because they used two years figures. If it's such a problem, you'd be able to use one year's figure. So they went 300 because that was two years. Um, and I thought, well, is it really going to be that many? Because I remember, because I've always been into tech and I brought Rob with me today. This is my first ever mobile phone, BT, <laughs> uh, BT Jet. Um, and so I worked for BT at the time. And the media at that point in time would say, mobile phones, dangerous, give out rays, give you cancer in the head, and whatever else. And because of that, every day I was getting abuse off customers, customers calling up, I want to cancel my contract because it's going to give me cancer. Or if you upgrade me to the Nokia phone that's smaller and slimmer, that'll emit less rays and I'll be happy with that. And, you know, it was, it was all that purely generated from the media stories. Um, which does show that the media does have that kind of influence that fear sells. Um, even before that, we saw that with the computer. I can remember when the first computer virus was reported and the, the news story literally had to say, don't worry, you can't catch it. Now, we think that's silly now, <laughs> but that just shows that back then, the ignorance, and we've got that at this point in time, there's ignorance about drones because people don't own them themselves. They've probably not got neighbours or friends who even own one, so they don't know about them at all. Um, all they will have seen is films on the TV, like Enemy of the State, with satellites that zoom down, and they've got that picture in the head. And that's what the media are using to scare people. So, obviously, with this freedom of information, I thought, well, I mean, at first I thought, I don't, you know, this is taxpayers' money. I don't really want to be doing this because it feels a bit frivolous. But I thought, well, I've got to because that's what everyone else is doing to get... A negative news story. Um, so I thought, well, I need to do that. And then let's have a look at this properly. So I put in a freedom of information request to the local police force, which is West Yorkshire Police in my case. Um, and then I had to go backwards and forwards and do a number of uh, follow-up uh, requests to get to the bottom of it. But what I want to show you, just so you will understand, I mean, especially people on here that are technical and understand how databases work, you'll see why um, this data isn't going to be accurate. Now, first of all, you'll not see this in the press, but this comes along with the uh, police report. Now, it tells you that the, uh, I don't know if that's mirrored for you or not, if you can see that properly, but it basically, it tells you that the data they're giving you isn't necessarily a complaint about drones. It is just a police log that happens to mention drones within it. So that's number one, that's never mentioned. This is the database query. You can see it's a bleeding free text field and they're searching for unmanned aerial vehicle or the word drone. So again, it's not necessarily a complaint. 
It's just a search of a free text field. So that's why you're going to get a lot of data in there that isn't a complaint about drones. So I thought, well, you know, clearly you're not going to have the numbers that they have said. So I asked them to actually narrow it down to my hometown where the newspaper had reported the figures. So they even did that for me, which we've got here. And it turned out Your that... Your camera just died. What's that, sorry? Your camera has just died. Oh, it's... Not, it's... not for me, it hasn't. Not for oh, me, okay. it hasn't. Yeah, it's just over to okay. Australia. So, but anyway... Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a censorship devices for the from Ballarat Council. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, the, the Queen hasn't authorised her subjects down here to see this, I understand. <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. You get it back in your box. But basically, in a nutshell... Um, that came down to a figure of 24 calls. So the newspaper figure of 300 was actually 24. And even that has calls in there that are clearly straight away not drone calls. So at maximum, it was 21. If I look at the categories that are likely complaints, that's 15. Uh, on this final, I could have gone back again, but again, I didn't want to use taxpayers' money unnecessarily, but I could have actually got that down to the logs for those and taken it down. And I might have got it below 15, but... I'd already proven by that point that the figures that are in the media are far higher than what they are in reality. And my other gripe I had was when these figures were being presented from the Freedom of Information request was the fact that they were packaged within um, a commentary that was negative. Now, if you present figures and you put a commentary around it, you're already putting a bias to the perception. So I want to play a game with you all so we can test this out. So I'm going to read you out a paragraph. And if you think that's positive about drones, put your thumb up. If you think it's neither positive nor negative, do that. And if you think it's ne uh, negative, do that. So you all, you all understand the rules, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right, okay. So I'll read, I'll read you this paragraph and see what you think with a statistic at the end. Besides the use of drones to deliver contraband into prison, the other major concern of the government has been in regards to the level of drones near misses with manned aircraft. Recently, it's been claimed that a Russian hobbyist drone flyer was able to get his machine weighing just over one kilogram to an altitude of 33,000 feet. West Yorkshire Police reported 167 drone calls. Now, do you think that's positive and negative? Yeah, negative anymore? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you are, all negative. So let me... Let me give you that exact same statistic in, a, in this sentence and see how this makes you feel. Drones are an exciting technology that are already beginning to have positive impacts on society. In 2017 alone, 65 people were rescued by drone technology and there are a whole wealth of potential uses where drones could make our work life safer. West Yorkshire has a population of 2.2 million, less than 167 people have, have found the need to complain to the police about drones. Now, which the, how does that make you feel? Oh, well done, your local paper, for making the positive point there. Or am I thinking it wasn't your local paper? <laughs> yeah, so, so what I've done there, obviously, as you've seen, I've taken the exact same statistic and then presented that within a different commentary. So that was showing there that how you can take a stat and then actually get the media to report it one way or another by the fact of the way you've presented it. Now... I will actually go through a couple of uh, call logs here and then we'll we'll finish with uh, another quiz unless anyone <laughs> has any questions. <laughs> now, now this is a, this is a, a call log that's kind of ironic. You might not be able to see it too well, but um, so here's one of the stats that would have been reported in the media as a complaint. It's a pilot as telling the police that he's filming for the BBC. So there we have the media reporting that it's a drug complaint for a task that's taking place for them. So that kind of just shows you the, the irony with the complaints that we have. Many of the complaints are, and here look, to demonstrate that they are actually, they shouldn't even be classed as drone complaints. Um, so two examples here, there's many, many more like this. It's basically theft from a vehicle, which where one of the items happens to be a drone, but that is not a drone complaint. That's a vehicle theft complaint. We've then got a shoplifting of a drone. Again, that's not a drone complaint. That's a shoplifting complaint. So completely wrong to categorise that as a drone complaint. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Ian, you've, you've yeah. missed something there. Yeah, go on. Uh, drones are, are clearly criminal um, devices. I mean, why else would a criminal steal one? <laughs> it's it's got to be because of the drones. Fair point, yeah. Very yeah. fair point. Yes. Awesome. 
Yeah, it's rampant. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm going to finish with a quiz. And so there's a competition between you all and see who can get it right. So well, Bruce always oh, wins. We'll, we'll see. We'll see who gets near. So here is the press headline. This is from uh, the last week, so it's fresh. Now, how many calls do you think were made, uh, and how what how many do you think it's increased by? I'll start four calls. That was four telephone say, calls. Say five. I'll I'll say three, just to random it out. Any others? I'll say chocolate. Chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll put you all out of your misery. It was fourteen calls rising to twenty-two, okay. and this is within a population of three hundred and twenty thousand people. So when you, I wonder, uh, I suppose to, to, to be fair to. to what other what other subject could you pick and then do a, a, a FOIA request on? Uh, I don't know, like uh, I don't know, go uh, football through greenhouse windows or something like that, or football, just football. The word football. That'd yeah, I mean, you're saying just yeah, yeah. the word football. Exactly. I mean, one point I've made when I'd, uh, I'd written the article was we have the NIMBY factor as well, where you will have neighbours where they'll complain about the neighbours' kids playing football. Um, just because of the noise of the ball kicking against the wall or such like. And, and drones aren't immune to that either. So even where you do get complaints, a lot of those aren't necessarily going to be valid. In fact, there's, um, let's see if I've got it here. There was, there was one that kind of struck me as, as that kind of, that kind of, in fact, it, it was kind of ironic, this, because it was the other way around. But let me see if I can find it. I was putting these out to be uh, prepared, but... Well, I think you're basically you're the most prepared guest ever. I think we'll put your note. We'll make a note <laughs> name for that. No, no, there, there was there was one where two neighbours were having a complaint, and um, one neighbour had said to the other, "I've seen you flying a drone about um, while well, I'm looking through your bedroom window." So it basically said her by text that they were looking through her window because they believed she was flying a drone, which I thought was kind of funny in that they were themselves committing a voyeuristic act and then the police log said that this person that had been accused didn't even own a drone so they just spotted someone else's drone and, and taken this uh, slightly vigilante action uh, one thing that does concern me with this actually and it um, forms part of another freedom of information request I've got in is amongst um, this narrative with drones there's been a deliberate effort to um, pick out drones flying near schools. So they're basically trying to insinuate that drone pilots are paedophiles. And that is really dangerous. Apart from the fact it's un, uh, untrue, it, it risks vigilante action. I mean, I've actually been out flying and it was on the week where the BBC did the report about the bag, what turned out to be a bag, but they'd already made drones guilty. And a lot of the UK drone industry had stepped in and already uh, made drone users guilty blaming hobbyists before they'd even looked at what was you know actually actually paused and waited um, so I actually had um, a member of the public come up to me and I'm flying in the field really quite threatening you know it was it was actually quite scary and I had to say look you know we don't know that this is even a positive drone incident it's nothing to do with me I'm out here flying in the field doing no harm to anyone um, but you, there are drone owners that are going to end up, and I know already have been threatened, but they're going to end up being assaulted for these false claims that people are making. Now, one thing that struck me, especially with schools, because like here in Bradford, we've got Queensbury School, it's got large playing fields. A lot of drone pilots use that because of the very reason we're told, go away from a residential area and they fly somewhere with lots of fields. So, they'll, you know, they'll go on an evening and they'll fly there on the fields completely safe. You know, there are a lot of parents at the schools. The school doesn't seem to mind because they're there when they teach about in an evening if they've got some uh, classes on. They never said, oh. Um, but if someone was to do a freedom of information request, they were, if, if someone had uh, seen a drone flying near a school, they, they put uh, two and two together and get five and say, there's something to worry about there. But no one actually ever says, was that call made on a weekend when the school was closed? was it on an evening outside school hours? So that's the actual information you need in addition to that to even, you know, to even come close to making that kind of connection. Uh, but that's what we're in the, the danger of when people misuse these kind of statistics. I had that, I had that myself uh, only recently. I was flying um, just down the road from the school. Um, it's in the back of a uh, 
beer, uh, beer garden for a pub to doing some shots and um later on that day on the on the local uh, facebook pages suddenly there was drone flying by school who anyone else see that what's going on and it was like oh yeah it's a, it's a pervert staring at the kids it was, it was me so uh, yeah, pervert yes yeah, staring at kids no um so <laughs> straight away you get that rush of people wanting to brand you just because um it's a drone whereas you know you can walk past a school with with a cam with your mobile phone taking photos uh you know just it, it, because it's a phone it's invisible you know they're not looking at that if it's a drone it obviously the only target the only place it is focused is the school so yeah it's very frustrating yeah, I mean, see, people don't appreciate the fact that the majority of these drones are flying about with wide-angle lenses. But if I want to see somebody close up, I have to be like five metres away. You know, it's not a stealthy way of ever, you know, trying to spy on anyone. You know it's there, it's noisy, it's got lights on it. Um, and you can buy it, if you want to spy on someone, you get a pair of binoculars for £20. It's not even a cost-effective way of doing it. So it's it's just a narrative that's being used um and we stand by it and we let it happen far too often. And I think the industry needs to start sort of pushing back and, and actually starting to try and command the narrative to put out the positives. And I have to say credit to DJ on that. We're keeping the count for the people that have been rescued by drones. There should be more of the industry doing that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we shouldn't have to be in the, in, in the point where we're having to justify it, but unfortunately, uh, th that's the position we've allowed ourselves to get into. Um, and I think it does need that fight back with using facts. And, and then the good thing with this is there are people now using the Freedom for Information Act, um, it's like called League, who couldn't make it on tonight, but he's got 60 requests in at the moment. So he's putting lots of figures together. And I encourage anyone, you know, if you, you could use it even as content for your own local, you know, for your website. You know, if, you, if you're there and you, you're... Um, commercial pilot, you know, you could actually find out these local statistics and actually put that as a little book story on your site's content. And you can also then control the narrative to show that it's not, you know, drones are not a problem. Uh, and that's the message we need to get out there. Well, I, I think we can, um, we can just roll it all the way back to how many people were killed by drones last year, you know. Um, it's just, it's a nonsense, and unfortunately we speak yes. on week on week <laughs> to this. And Bruce is, is, is probably in the nation, I think, that at the moment is suffering the greatest at the hands of the media and uh, misinformation. The uh, pilots' union down there seem to be doing a fantastic job of uh, keeping them top of mind. And you've just had a, a study where I think 60% of you... Um, operate illegally and outside of the rules and that's 60 i don't want to pull and i've put it in the show notes at the bottom but it was only based on like four thousand no one thousand four hundred and sixty drone pilots in the survey so um yeah, yeah it, 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 that's interesting because i looked at that survey and one of the most interesting things about that survey is i didn't know that it took place and i'm a pretty active drone operator um and it was done by canvassing people who use the airshare website which is a website mainly for commercial operators, right? So this is the thing we've got the, the stats say. Sure, 60 I, I, I hope you. I hope you're not going to suggest then that that there's a self-selecting group of people have made well, another group of people seem <laughs> somewhat wayward. I hope you wouldn't yes, gonna move towards exactly. that. Well, if you look at the breakdown of the people who responded, 60.34 percent are recreational operators and 40.66 percent were commercial operators now i know the ratio of commercial to recreational operators is far more disparate than that i would say that less than 10 percent of the drone operators in new zealand are commercial 90 percent are recreational but we've only got um at you know just over half of the commercial or the recreational users represented in the survey so the results are going to be entirely skewed because it doesn't represent the average drone flyer at all it's the figures are going to be miles out and as i say i'm an active drone flyer i didn't even know this was going on apparently even though i'm on the airshare website i didn't get the email saying come and participate in our survey and it was on social media now that probably means facebook and i don't use facebook to any degree so if you're like me and you don't use facebook well you are automatically not selected. So uh, this is, you know, this kind of information is completely skewed and wrong. And there's nothing, the only thing worse than no information is bad information. That's exactly what we've got here. And speaking of the whole um, bad information thing, 
I see the quarterly incident reports have been just published here in New Zealand, and they've now got a complete section for RPAS incidents. This is the first time in the quarterly reports I've separated out RPAS. I'll read you a couple of the incident reports. And this An R44 pilot, the pilot reported a near miss with a UAV at 400 feet when returning to the airfield. Why was he at 400 feet for a start? Everyone? The UAV was operating near the airport with a second person as a contact spotter. The operator was asked to land when the helicopter requested to return to the airfield. The controller thought they thought they saw the UAV descending, but it may have been a gull. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Here's the other one. This is a commercial flight. Um, this is in January the 12th. The flight crew reported they spotted an object on their flight path at a similar altitude, which at first glance appeared to be a drone in the hover. The object quickly passed down the port side of the aircraft at close proximity. The crew were unable to positively identify the object, reporting that it was possibly too large for a drone and could have been the remains of a weather balloon. But this is reported as an RPAS incident, right? So just about all these reports here are, we saw something, it could have been a drone, but it probably wasn't. And it's listed as an RPAS incident. I mean, no, you can't do that. You've got to be more accurate in your reporting. Or again, we've got something that's worse than no information. We've got bad information that's skewed and erroneous. And it means that if, if the regulators are operating on bad information, they will produce bad regulation. That just makes the whole thing worse. Well, I think, you know, I'm going to entitle this video fear-based regulation because that's that's what's being rolled out everywhere, unfortunately, without the benefit of, of, of facts. And, um, you know, Ian's, Ian's article is great. Again, it's in the show notes, so do do read it if you haven't. Um, and what, uh, who, who in the industry is good? Well, um, actually, let's bring Philip in before I go on a, on a separate rant. Um, Philip, you you face fear-based regs with your Ballarat Council, but you beat them yep. back with a stick. Yeah, and it, it actually, um, there's there's actually more to the the old story on that one. Um, uh, we approached council and actually beat them back with their own regulations because there's actually regulations about how you form regulations. Um, and so we found the regulations on how you get local laws to actually exist. And uh, you basically inquired about the methods that they'd gone through to actually come up with these laws, how they'd actually verified that there was a problem to start with, um, how they could have used existing regulations outside of the council to actually uh, improve uh, the situation and how they'd consulted with the local community and the people affected. And, you know, the... The local laws guy got up and said, look, I have to admit, I've dropped the ball on this one. That's a direct quote. Um, and the councillors moved a motion to remove all references to, of drones from the local laws because we already have the Civil Aviation Safety Authority to run the skies of Australia. And therefore, we don't actually need local councils interfering with that because, well, this is a 10-year law. Drones are a fast moving topic and you know next year the rules are going to be different this year and they're going to be different the year after because it's it's a fast moving industry and you need people that are actually experts in it not the media not local laws um working on it and ironically since then the council themselves have been putting up all sorts of drone videos on their website um all of them which have been flown illegally um flown right uh, within a kilometre of our local airport, within the flight approaches of our local airport, um, just over people flying, doing follow me shots down. They've got a new highway that's just opened near town and it's right next to the airport and they're doing follow me down the road to show off the road over users, over normal people. They had an open day with bikes and people running along the road just for the fun of it. And again, a drone over the top of it. And it's sort of like these are the people that wanted to regulate drones for the local area and they clearly can't even read the links that we provided to them on the basic what you can do under standard operating conditions of uh, running a drone. And unfortunately, this is, this is what's happening. People are getting scared by um, the, the risk that drones present and they're feeling like they need to be ahead of it be be on the on the they don't want to be on the back foot so they want to get rules in place just in case and the the reality is that like you mentioned when was the last drone death um we've got lots of things we don't regulate lots of things that we don't enforce that actually are terrifying and scary i mean our road toll in australia is probably no better or worse than any of you guys have in your countries and yet we've still got things like proton jumbucks. I don't know if you guys have those things. They're a little proton ute 
that has zero star safety rating and they're still on the road, you know, um, and we're worried about drones. Though, unfortunately, there's just such a disconnect between the reality of these, um, the fear-mongering that goes with it um, to, to the actual dangers that are, that are associated with it. So, yeah, um, I, I think it actually takes standing up to local governments and most of these people, they're just reading the paper and getting scared the way everyone else is and they're trying to do their jobs right. They're trying to protect their local constituents. Um, they're try, they are trying to do the right thing. So, you know, getting angry at them isn't the right thing. But uh, re-education of uh, our politicians is very important. Well, and then I'll, I'll bring in the whole what's the industry. I, I, I want to talk about the UK quarterly air props reports in, in uh, respect to uh, Bruce's chucking a multi-rotor or a drone through a, a helicopter tail rotor in a minute. But anyway, um, <laughs> I've put a link in, in, in the live chat. It's the S92. We'll talk about Bruce if you because oh, I haven't mentioned that. But I, I spoke, and part of the reason for contacting Ian and and. and because I spoke at a conference a couple of weeks ago, and the guy before me was, um, this will make sense in a minute, I hope, Price Waterhouse, and he came up with some fantastical figures. And then the guy after me was from the insurance industry, who was scary, 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 scary man about the danger and everything. And, and this was to an audience of people that are in the industry, if you will. So this, this was an audience of people that have got, a vested interest in the correct and right information being out. And we're both ends of it. We're the sensational, you're all going to be, this time next year, Rodney, we'll all be millionaires. And to, to don't, they're all going to fall down on your head. And I couldn't believe it. So is the industry actually capable at the moment of talking sense to anybody from any direction? <coughs> I don't believe so. Uh, it's, all, it's all over the place. And um, there's no... There needs to be some central voice, and uh, you know, you would, you would, one would assume the CAA, but we're all hoping and praying, we're all waiting for something magical to happen, and it may well happen in, in the near future. But the main, the main issue in in the in the UK is is awareness and understanding of of the laws and regulations, and and the, the public perception. You say. The media is controlling that narrative. There's no one help else trying to control it except for us pilots, and we're, it's an uphill battle. Um, so yeah, someone needs to you know take the gauntlet and and run with it really, and uh, get that news out there, make and turn the negative into a positive. Yeah, I think I'd actually like to put a defence in for the news a little bit. Um, our local news, um, the Ballarat Courier, which I'll shout out to them. <laughs> um, have been amazing in um, in their in their assistance in getting this um, through in Ballarat, because um, most news organisations actually heavily rely on drones these days, and um, you know the new regulations would have made it impossible to actually get a drone in to take a photograph of a critical news item without them first applying for a permit and waiting twelve days before they could report. Or whatever. Um, so there are actually some news organisations that are a little bit more smart, and the trick is, you know, finding those people within those news organisations and actually getting them to convince their editors that hey, a positive drone news story is actually good as well, um, and we can we can spin it like Ian suggested with his. Uh, news stories, there is a way of actually putting the same information out there that doesn't have to be doom and gloom and not every yeah, news person wants that. It, it's, it's the low, you know, the most popular media in this country is the red tops, you know, the, the red top newspapers. It's, it's the, and they, they target the, you know, the, the lowest common denominator. Um, and what sells papers, you know, it, it, fear, you know, danger, death. Um, if you put a nice story, Drone saves um, saves child from sea. Yeah, yeah, that's a great story. Drone kills child. That's going to be a, a lot more dramatic, and that and that will sell more papers. You know, it's just it's not just with drones; it's with anything in the media. Um, so yeah, I think what what I would say with that though is um, probably twofold. 
um, what did we mentioned earlier that, that there isn't um, there isn't enough um, fight back within the industry. There isn't a single voice in Europe. There's the Drone Manufacturers Alliance Europe, but they hardly ever speak. Um, it'd be good if we heard more from them. I think if unfortunately within Europe, DJI, um, I think their presence is over. I don't know if it's Germany or it's 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 not in the UK anyway. So. We don't hear their voice so much, and obviously they're the the biggest part of the market, um, and then no one else has really taken or tried to take any lead. Um, mm. And I'm trying to think, well, where else I was going with this? Um, I got off on a tangent there when I mentioned them. Um, <laughs> it was something that Philip had said. Um, no, actually, go, go with someone else. I'll come back to me in a minute. Oh, it's not just me that does that. Oh, let's circle back round. All right, let's 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 because obviously we're all perfect pilots, and we'll, none of us will ever do anything wrong at any time ever. Um, but there are people out there that are doing um, um, bad bad things. And in the UK, uh, Airprox reports, uh, Sir Bruce. Um, there's there's one from there's one that I will believe. And I'll, I'll quickly read it out. It's an S-92, so Coast Guard rescue helicopter. The S-92 pilot reports they were conducting wet winching training in the vicinity of the coastline and had a winchman on the wire. So they're in the hover near a cliff. All the crew members are looking out. This is, you know, heads out doing the job. Um, had a winchman on the wire in the surf and they saw a small drone just outside the rotor disc in the 10 o'clock position. The drone remained in close proximity while the winchman was recovered and then flew away towards the shore. So, you know, that I, I think I'll trust that helicopter crew. They're a Coast Guard crew, and there's several of them, and they know what they're doing. So then as an industry, what are we going to do? What are we going to do about that? How are we, how are we going to make... Oh, here's Nicola. Hey, g'day, 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 g'day. Yeah, the baby. G'day, man. Uh, and we've blamed you. It was your fault. Everything was your fault. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> All right. I'll take that hit. Good. That's um, no, fine. Just... Uh, to be completely honest, I totally forgot. That's so right. Uh, we've so so did I. I've not been here. No, Bruce. Well, what you, you want to you want to chuck it? You want to chuck a a, um, a a drone through a, a helicopter tail rotor? It seems to me like that that would have been a good chance. What are we going to do about the? There are some bad actors out there. What are we going to do about them as a community? Is that not what we've got to do first? Is sort out sort our own act out first? Yeah, well, there are such a small number of bad actors. Look at how many how many million drones are out there now. How many incidents do we see, verified incidents, infinitesimal. I think that people driving on the roads are a bigger group who are less compliant. I mean, there are so many accidents every day. And it doesn't matter how many people you get, there's always going to be that small percentage who do not do things properly. But you can't hold the rest of the community responsible for the actions of those tiny few any more than I can be held responsible if someone drives at 300 kilometres down the local motorway. It's not my fault. I guess I do drive a vehicle, but it wasn't me driving that. And I can't be responsible for those people's actions. Now, I did say in my latest rant that we should uh, take the um, initiative and when we see someone doing something bad go and give them a kick up the backside and tell them off I mean we have to do that as we have to be self-policing to a high degree but um, it, we just have to draw the parallels with other groups where we don't hold everyone responsible for the actions of a tiny minority and, and that's all we can really do that actually reminds me of what my point was if you look at the motor industry they back cars you don't see the motor industry doing a tweet look at this terrible accident wasn't that such a bad driver and if you look at any twitter account even industry twitter accounts the tweeting out any bad example they can find of a, of a drone pilot so we're actually we're, we're amplifying the problem above what it is even as an industry we should be tweeting out positive stories as it is, the industry, as I've seen, well, your actual normal hobbyists, you know, your normal commercial pilots, if we see a bad video on YouTube, people are jumping all over it, it's posted on multiple groups, and people are saying, that is bad, it shouldn't be happening. I know everyone here would be able to name at least one bad actor, because some of them are posting stuff on YouTube, and it's so well known. And the police can see that too. So to be honest, the, the issue there is they're not acting. Um, so all we can do as a community is say, you know, these people are bad actors, flag them. But after that, it's, it's out of our hands. But what we shouldn't be doing is also 
is bashing ourselves about it. We should say we've called them out. The rest of us uh, are doing as we should do. And we need to look at the industry in a fair manner that looks at the safety record, that actually looks at incidents that happened or as it is lack of incidents because there aren't that many. Um, as we said, you know, there aren't deaths. If you looked at the automobile, I mean, even I, I, I use this many times. It's a, it's a silly stat, but it's true. Well, you know, Reuters reported this, that over 300 people a year, and actually, no, it's over 700 people a year are killed by household toasters. And we don't have a license to use a toaster or a test. And, and but you know, but you've got TVs that will fall on kids. You've got people injuring themselves on trampolines. You're more likely to be killed by a shark or taking a selfie. So when you look at the whole context of everything in life, drones really don't deserve the um, the, the targeting that they're getting. One thing you've got to be really careful with when you're when you're doing comparisons with toasters and things, which the the the, the drone dislikers will bring up, is that when you use a toaster, it's only your own life at risk. When you fly a drone, you're endangering other people. There's a huge distinction there between oh, yeah, but something. No, that, so at the yep. same time, though, all these other stats you could look at, you have that house household DIY in America. There are thousands of people not involved in the DIY injured by it for like nail guns going off knots. So there are other activities we will do that will injure third parties for which they had no control over. Playing football, riding a bike, riding a skateboard. Uh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> you know, just say driving a car, even even running down the road. You could knock someone over and, and then they can hit their head and die. Yeah, yeah you have to look at uh, the probability in all this and drones um currently um i think is you know there's a low probability of killing someone compared to everyday things we do all the time without thinking about it and it's not even questioned so yeah it's um, interesting it is hyped one of the things that a lot of people i've, I've had um, someone from caa come back at me with this actually and i said look i've been doing this for 60 years never killed anyone never damaged any property and the response was it's just luck and my reply wow. to that is do you know how probability is calculated how risk is calculated luck is one of the factors it's called probability <laughs> and you know probability chance and the deciding factor in chance is or probability is luck so i would rather have an ounce of luck than a pound of skill any day of the week but you, you can't just but, say but because it's never the point like this is why well, i refuse to fly Qantas. <laughs> I mean, they've never had a crash, so they're due to have one. Yes, that's that's true. true. <laughs> they, <laughs> they have, they have, they, they have had a crash. They have had a crash. They had a run. They, they had a runway run off in yeah. Bangkok. They had a runway. Never stand under any of the Qantas aircraft. Bits will fall on you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I can't believe they said that. I can't believe they actually said that to you, Bruce. That's just that. That's just ridiculous i cannot believe it and i i just wanted to flip back i remembered while we we're talking there freedom of information requests SGS news is 10 years old this year and back in august of 2009 i reported on the air robot squads used by derbyshire police um to there was a, a british national party uh rally at codnor they're not a particularly nice uh, group of people and the quad wasn't used to uh, to see what they were doing. It was used to look at the people protesting against the BMP. And what they, what the, those protesters did, we shall call them the good side, um, what they did, they put a freedom of information request in for all the photos taken by that quad. And I remember it ended up costing Derbyshire Police Force an absolute fortune because they had to supply prints of the photos to thousands of people. So that was an early use back in 2009. And, and it was, and also the thing that got me, because Air Robots was a German brand back then. So it was a German brand looking at the protesters against the Nazi group. And it, anyway, lots of stuff there, lots of stuff of interest. Um, and yeah, I know it cost Derbyshire Police a fortune in the end. Anyway, so freedom of information. Anyway, sorry, that was my aside rant that I just remembered. Where should we take this conversation now? Well, we, should we start talking about what's happening in the UK tomorrow, perhaps? Yes, all right. Yeah, just good. start talking then. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Ian, what do you reckon? It's, it's, well, it's do, magic you want to, do you want to do a quick overview just for people watching? Because not everyone, will, well, a lot of people won't know about it yet. 
So tomorrow, allegedly, apparently, perhaps, uh, set before Parliament will be changed to the Air Navigation Order of 2016, whereby, and this is coming everywhere, and this is exactly this is what the insurance guy was desperate for in uh, in the conference I was talking about here, here in Johannesburg was registration, registration of drones above 250 grams. So that should be coming in. There should be a competency test uh, for remote pilots to obtain an acknowledgement of competency from the CAA, having pass requirements set by the CAA, such as an online safety test. A 400 foot, that's pretty universal, restriction from flying drones within a kilometre of protected aerodromes in the UK, unless you have permission of air traffic control. Measures one and two will not come into force until 30th November 2019. Three and four, which is the height and the restriction from aerodromes, will come into force on the 30th of July, so just around the corner. Um, I was a little bit out of the loop. We have we had been told about all this. I guess I just wasn't expecting it. Um, Bruce, I think, haven't we got the Danish to thank for two? Who was it? Who do we blame for the 250 grand? I think the Danish came up with that. Was it, was it the Danish or was it the Americans? Because of, that was the size of a piece of flak or something. I remember it, something in World War II was something they calculated as being a critical mass for something. What's a protected aerodrome? Well, what's a, what, what's the difference between a model aeroplane and, um, and a, what's a drone? Well, nobody knows. <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> there, we are. There, there we are. Silence in the room. Um, is, that, is that an RC airplane or a passenger airplane? And I'm I'm thinking not everything that flies should be considered a drone. I assume a drone is something that has at least a GPS unit and return to home capability is something like an autopilot, like a regular uh, like a glider or a 3D aerobatics airplane, you have none of that in it, it can't function on its own. So, why is it called a drone? Well, anything that's called a drone is called a drone because of the Queen Bee tiger moth that was converted um, in, in between the wars, and an American saw it and it was called the Queen Bee and it droned around, so it became a drone. And that's why anything's called a drone. Uh, don't believe anything else. Um, uh, but uh, my understanding is anything that can sustain flight, be controlled in three axis from the ground and does not have a, an operator on board is an autonomous, or oh, is a I'm getting it wrong now. Is an unmanned aircraft or a remotely piloted aircraft? So a model aircraft would would fall into that category uh, without any form of GPS, but it's being operated under your local country's model aircraft rules. But I think in the UK, you guys are a caveat of uh, a sensor, and the sensor can it doesn't have to be just a camera. It can be uh, uh, lidar or, or that isn't. But yeah, it can be any other sense as well. Maybe Ian, can you, do you know? Yeah, I think, I think it has wording in there of surveillance. So the idea is that it's it's a drone with a payload. So if it was a model aircraft, um, I would expect it to be exempt the way the law is now. But that's just off the top of my head. But yeah, it's definitely got wording to that effect. Um, I wonder what's going to happen to the FPV community over there. Well, that's one thing I don't know with this because the FPV has the rule where you can go to a thousand foot, and obviously this says four hundred, so it might be the case that that's out of the window. Uh, but that'll need somebody that's more in more knowledgeable. You, this. you had a very good chap. What's his name? Simon something or other. Is very very good chap uh, who got that thousand foot ruling in, and it was it was sort of um, evidence based that it was safe. So things were getting Simon. Is it Simon? Um, I can't remember. Um, I don't know. Yeah, it's, 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 it was certainly it was something that, that that was fought for with justification. So, if that has gone, then the, I think that, that there will be a lot of people unhappy about it. But uh, we're probably speculating at this point, and we'll, we'll need to see the details. It might be that that exception's still there. Um, we just don't know that from the information that's out there today. Just getting uh, in the in the comments. We fly any drone. We fly any drone. Dot com. I like that. Uh, would you have us call the police out instead? You've got a comment there, Ian. So you and uh, Pudu <laughs> Jabba. <laughs> you keeps making me have to say his name. Says that it's the uh, La Cour Harbo 2017 mass threshold for harmless drones. International Journal of Micro Aerial Vehicles. That is where that 250 grams. Alberg Uni, Denmark. You see. I knew it was a day. It's not just the bacon. It was that as well. I knew it. 
I knew it. They've also got a fantastic test site there as well, uh, where they make manufacturers prove their figures, which I think is a very good idea. But anyway, <laughs> I'm going off topic there, aren't I? Um, so, so what do we think then, Ian? What's the takeaway with these new regs in the UK? Do we love them, hate them, step I think, forwards, backwards? I think people will have different views. I mean, from my viewpoint, I don't have issue with the above 400 feet. I mean, if regards FPV, I don't do that. So it's not something that affects me but i would just because there's a lot of nice people doing that i think i just you know doing the hobby responsibly i wouldn't like that to be seen taken away from them so i hope that exemption is still there um the, the one thing that is good with having a height there in the legislation is at least the police can act on it so if you have media posting a youtube video and is at like six thousand feet look at me i'm over london doing this at least then they can act they can say well it's just a clear breach so from that viewpoint it, it, it helps police enforcement so I, I don't have an issue for it from that viewpoint um the distance away from an airport again it's that's that's common sense not an issue um although i do think that with the, the no fly zone that the technology has been there a long time we, we, when you look at the the media and that's coming out from government it's almost like we've invented this idea of no fly zone and forced it to be implemented when no we haven't it's been it's been there for years um so we have that and, and, that, and then obviously there's downsides with that for commercial operators where i wish there was more common sense in that you've got to go through a right rigmarole to get one unlocked sometimes there can be overlapping no fly zones. so you think it's unlocked turns out it's not so people are not able to do jobs um it would be nice to have um a method in there of sensibly being able to remove those. I mean, I think unique. Pilot. Yeah, well, obviously you've got that with RG Pilot. Um, unique with their software, have it where you can just have it disabled then once you've proved you're a commercial pilot. DJI say, no, we can't do that. But of course you could. You could have a, a web portal where you, you prove that you're a commercial pilot, unlocks it. But when you, because they say, well, when, well, when you come to sell it, you can say, yeah, I'll go back to this portal. I'll tell you you've sold it. You can automatically deactivate it again. It doesn't have to be an issue. And it doesn't have to be difficult. But unfortunately, at the moment, it is. So that, that that aggravates people. We should be able to have systems that don't inconvenience people at the same time. So that's where we, we need to be with that. Um, I do have issue with um, people having to register. For me, if, if, if you're really concerned about safety and you're concerned about drones and the impact, why are we doing a register? Why not we're saying compulsory insurance instead? To me, that would make more sense, you know, having to have uh, liability insurance. In, in the UK, that's one thing that is quite cheap. I think it's about £20 a year if you're a hobbyist. That's not a lot of money. And, you know, when, when I'd be a financial hobby, uh, as, as a hobbyist, I've had that. I just think it's responsible because if you did do some damage, you'd be legally uh, responsible for that and it could end up costing you a lot of money. So, or, you know, assuming you could do... Uh, any significant damage, but def there's definitely a risk there. So having the insurance, I think, would be a good thing, but we're not even doing that. So we're just saying, we will have a register of your addresses. Um, so it's it's almost, it, I, I don't fully understand the purpose for it because people that are gonna be irresponsible aren't gonna put themselves on it anyway. So all it's gonna be is a database of responsible pilots. But the problem is the moment there's any irresponsible drone activity or even someone says i've seen a drone it's not a drone but they've made a mistake they've called the police the police are going to end up knocking on the door of the people on the register that are the legitimate pilots so they're going to be being hassled all the time potentially and that's the bit that concerns me i mean we have seen in the uh last month uh a, a commercial operator with the caa turned up on his door because he's there and he's registered so if he was a bad actor not on any the database anywhere the CAA wouldn't be able to turn up at his door but because he's registered they can and that will be is that going to happen to all the hobbyists with local police forces you know it's, it depends how it's going to be used but there, there are those questions I mean how do you how do you effectively deal with that you know what problem is it really addressing and without any insurance need I, I just I don't I just don't understand that it's, it's a token okay. gesture I that's, think, what it, yeah, that's where the conversation needs to finish is what problem are we trying to solve the, the, we've got regulation coming in for what problem like there are already regulations in the uk in the us in south africa 
in Australia, all over the place. Like um, all of the complaints around Australia that keep getting up and the number of flights within the controlled airspace of Charles Kingsford Smith Airport in Sydney, um, they're already clearly in breach of the existing laws. So enforce them. Like, yeah. why do we need new ones? Um, yeah. If people are breaking the law, they're a lawbreaker. Whether they're speeding in a car, whether they're flying a drone too high, if you've got evidence against someone, do something about it. Don't make new laws because they're not following the existing ones. Why are they going to follow new ones? Like, it just it it seems nuts. I'm I'm quite actually I'm actually quite uh, surprised that you have a one kilometer uh, buffer around airports in the UK that actually is amazingly small. Um, but yeah, it's it's what problem are we trying to solve that we don't already have? Um, the ability to, to solve. Yeah, and, yeah, I think well, the other thing also is that thing about the one kilometre exclusion, it shows you how little understanding regulators have got around the world. In Canada, it's five nautical miles. In New Zealand, it's four kilometres. In the UK, it's one kilometre. In Australia, I think um, this, if you're flying a 2kg, yeah, if you're flying 2kg, isn't that sort of um, closer to the sides than the approach path and things like that in some categories of drone operation? It's like none of the regulators actually know what the hell they're doing. Otherwise, there'd be one consistent figure to cover airfields. And in, for example, in um, in Canada, it's one kilometre from a heliport. In New Zealand, it's 4k from a heliport, just like a fixed wing aircraft, uh, you know, like a normal airport. So, like, there's no dispensation made. No one's actually thought this through and said, this is the minimum safe distance you should fly a drone to an airport. They've just plucked figures out of their backsides and said, this is what we're going to do and we're going to be different because we're going to lead the world and it's something that, oh, yeah. that around the world governments seem to think it is important enough to make lots of regulation but it's not important enough to actually enforce those regulations and that's the problem we've got okay. yes it's, it's 10 yeah. sorry it's 10 kilometers here just if we're keeping count and that's wow. 10 kilometer radius um and uh, and every single time i've been where one of our um uh, where our regulators spoke and they say when we lead the world <laughs> they have used that, they've used that phrase nicola sorry over to you i think i think the whole problem might be stemming from the fact that nobody actually knows what problems and what damage a drone can cause because there are pretty much no records of that nobody seems to know what problem like you said these regulations should be fixing so they're just random just you know, well, somebody, somebody thinks of something and they just put it in just like that. Nobody thinks about it because nobody knows if that is actually a valid concern or not. And that whole registration well, I mean, thing really... We need to give is... the Chinese credit. They actually tested. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there have been tests done and the data in the US um, quite recently as well. Um, what basically says that most drones, most commercial, uh, sorry, uh, publicly available drones that are under, I can't, I, I'm just going to make up figures here, under under seven kilograms are going to pose very little um, threat to most, most planes, most passenger planes. If it's a smaller plane, yeah, it might cause trouble, but um, yeah, in, in general, it's going to be the larger, um, if the, the larger planes they're not going to have an issue not if a, if, a, if a normal drone just hits them average drone hits them it's, it's gonna do nothing it won't it won't affect the plane and put those people's lives at risk yeah it the, won't affect the plane because they constantly collide with even heavier birds while flying some geese can weigh up to 10 12 kilograms and that's that's much more than the mass of drones flying around but it's not just the mass. It, it's you know, obviously you know, uh, birds don't contract don't contain um, chemicals that will explode um, when hit, and unfortunately, drones but, but with neither, lipo batteries. Neither do drones. Um, like I'm, I'm sorry, but you know, a, a drone battery, a lithium battery, yeah. number one is flexible. Um, you you can you can put a butter knife through a. Uh, a drone battery with not much force <laughs> like the the way the media portrays these drone batteries you think they're cased in titanium or something like that's it's not how they are they've got a soft polymer outside yes they've got metals in them that they're foils like you know your your lunch is wrapped in something harder than a than a drone battery 
the plastic outside casing of a drone battery, you know. But is, I think it's, it's the potential for combustion. Have you, tried to combust the a, uh, <clears throat> have you tried to combust so a new battery? And, yeah, you wouldn't want your face over it when it combusted, but <laughs> I'd quite happily combust one in, in my engine bay of my car, and if I left it unattended, yeah, it'll eventually catch on fire, but we're talking a gas turbine high-bypass engine here. Yeah. It's it's here hit and the shrapnel's gone and if it's on fire four kilometers behind the aircraft, who cares? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the ground is not even on fire. Like but this one kilometer in England. That... Yes, <laughs> ten here. <yeah. laughs> I've actually I've actually had a battery catch fire on top of uh, the engine on one of our cars, and uh, the hood was closed actually. And my wife came upstairs and she said, you know. There's smoke coming from under the hood. And I was like, what the hell? <laughs> and she just casually, you know, walking the room. Oh, by the way. And I ran downstairs and turns out the battery caught fire. And it was a small battery while it was charging. And I closed the hood because the car's on the street. I'm not going to stay there for an hour. Got nothing to do down there. And uh, it, it melted the plastic that's covering the engine. And it burned through the uh, heat shielding on top of the hood, but that was about it. Replaced both. No other real damage. And I don't think a battery combusting uh, in, a, in a crash is going to cause much damage because the speed at which these passenger planes are moving, they, they're going to be far off when this happens. And besides, I've tried combusting a new battery because they're constantly changing the chemistry in there, whether we know it or not. And I've tried to uh, punch through one of the new, uh, for instance, the two uh, racing line uh, batteries. That was, I have it on film. At some point, I'm probably going to share it. That, that was one of the most uneventful, I won't <laughs> even call it combustions. I punctured it through and through, and it just kept smoking and smoking and smoking, and then nothing happened. And I was genuinely disappointed. But if that it goes in the cockpit of a plane, the pilots won't be able to see. Okay. How all, all, all the smoke, yeah, because there? of all the smoke. <laughs> yes. Okay. How's it going to yep. make it all the way there? It but they, get but they have iPads the and things in those planes. But... That's a good point, yeah. I mean, just, just try to imagine the chances, the probability, like Bruce said, of the battery, the battery ending up in the cockpit of a plane a few kilometers high moving at what anything from 200 to a thousand kilometers an hour first it has to hit the drone second it has to hit it in a particular way that would enable like probably the, the front plane of uh, the front side of the plane to puncture the windshield open up on the inside like it's depositing some sort of a virus and then eject the plane <laughs> while puncturing it in the cockpit so it would either catch fire or just start releasing smoke for the pilots to be distracted and most of those planes do have autopilots which do most of the flying anyway so i'm, wouldn't I'm pretty sure difference. i'm pretty sure the regulators will have actually done the research and found that if you are a, if you register yourself or your drone your batteries are far less likely to explode <laughs> That's true. No, that's absolutely true. Yeah, but there could there could be an element of that. I'd like, like to see that test report, by the way. No, but there, so, there could so be. So do we element. have to register Samsung users? Because you know we've had quite a few Samsung phones catch fire in aircraft. So not not allowed on. They're not they're not allowed on flights here. Big big signs at the airports. Don't get on the plane. Don't bother coming. Don't phone home. Um, yeah, they're not allowed on the plane yet. But I was just going to say there might actually be some truth, a little bit grain of truth to registered people's batteries not catching fire so much. Because if you're the sort of person that takes time to register, do all the stuff, and you're probably self-selecting yourself to be safer anyway. Uh, in the comments, um, just, just so we get some of these comments, weflyanydrones.com, insurance is a massive topic. The first million pound liability claim will put a massive burden on the 2,000 commercial operators. We've had, we've had a, a million pound claim in South Africa for a camera hanging off. Well, that's already the insurance industry has been tested. Perhaps that's why the guy was after me talking at the show was so doom and gloom. Um, and I know a bit more about that million pound claim, but that's 
for the pub, not for here. And then the next one, the new from Dragon's Dragon's Eye Filming, um, the new DFT registration allows for accountability by the fact that the online test will have been taken by that person in theory, that is, so it can be used to strengthen the case against improper use. I'm quite sure. Can I just revisit the online enough. test? Here you go, mate. Like. Um, CASA have just released the, re well, sorry, the Senate has just released the report on, um, on CASA rules in Australia and, um, you know, where there might be gaps and things like that and some suggestions. And of course, they keep mentioning a particular drone manufacturer has taken steps to ensure that its users are, you know, smart by having an online test before they're allowed to take off. Now, I've seen some of those questions and, you know, you get three random questions or something and, they're pathetic and they're not even necessarily based on fact. And it's worse sudden, than that, Philip. Yeah, so to do what you can get every single fun. one of them wrong and you can just keep hitting buttons until you've got right. So there isn't any consequence to even getting them wrong. Yeah, and so now we say, okay, so we've educated the public. Or oh, I'm sorry, but a drone manufacturer, it would be like me saying, you know, before you fly with a cube, I'm going to make a test. Like, I'm, I'm biased. I, I admit I'm biased. Um, like, if you're going to have an online test, it's got to actually be done by some people that actually have some knowledge. And in Australia, we have that. It's called, you know, an RP, uh, li uh, sorry, a remote pilot license. Um, it, it's not that hard to go and actually go and get some real training or or at least send them down to a local airfield and say, go into a trial introductory flight and see how hard stuff is to see from the air or something. But like, there's so many existing training schools and stuff like that. They do these little online tests that anyone can pass, and it's just too basic to even matter. I just, I, yeah, it hurts me. The, the problem is getting people to do the test and to register online. I think the only way you could get a lot of that, there's a lot of people just thinking, this is just going to be a list so the government can tax me, they can increase the price every year, and it's just a money-making exercise, especially with there being no insurance requirement there. It just says, well, why do you need my details? It can only be because you want to extract money from me. And that's a view people have got. And whilst they've got that view, they're not going to register. The only way you could get people to register is we could have that carrot and stick approach, i.e., if you, if you haven't done the test, you know, the consequences will be there in law, but there should be something that's um, a reward there. So, for example, at the moment, you can't fly within 150 metres of a built area. You say, well, you pass this test and we'll take it down to 75 metres or something. Mm -hmm. You know, something where you say, if you take this test, you will have this benefit. And then people are going to do it because they're going to think, actually, I've, I'm getting something out of that. But as long as there's no benefit to be had, and it, it, it's, I, I don't see how you're going to motivate uh, a lot of a lot of hobbyists to register on there oh, it all comes down to public sure? awareness i think because the, 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 look we all it's all about you say going back to the, the first topic about um drones being bad and um the member and members of the public not being clued up to the point where you know they class as almost anything is illegal as we all know we've all had that situation we've been out flying perfectly safe and then we've um, been accosted by someone with a camera uh, accusing us of this that and the other um now the registration is not going to do anything to solve that issue and we would be the people saying yeah but we're registered with commercial whatever you know, we're allowed to be here it all goes back to education of the masses we all know the basic rules for driving a car we all know uh, and the laws we all know the basic laws for uh, murder and stabbing you know but when it comes to drone rules it's 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 all over the place and people are just they pull figures out in the air and they make stuff up um and this is the issue if if everyone knew what what we're allowed and not allowed to do it stopped the the unnecessary um complaints about drones but also that education will go on to the flyers, so they'll know what to do. They'll know what instinctively, you can't fly that close, we can't do that. And that will help the situation um, in, in general, you know, by everyone being educated on what we can and can't do. 
it was a hey, stop the complaints but it also stopped people acting out um you know, when you when i first bought, bought a drone um i didn't have a clue you know, drone code didn't exist i wasn't going to start reading the caa website i went off and fly in my garden straight away you know less than 50 meters for uncontrolled um potentially congested area rule break rule break rule break i had to see how far i could fly it all oh, out of line of sight rule break you know, everyone does it no matter if they admit it or not they all they all done it but if I, you know, if I was aware of, of the laws and it was common knowledge about what you can and can't do, such as driving, such as murder, um, I wouldn't have done that or, or I've been a, a lot more prepared you know, not to go to push it to that extent because I know I'm actually in the wrong by doing that. So I think, it's, again, it's public awareness of, of, of our hobby, of our industry and what these machines can do will actually affect every part of it and you know the policing of it as well and the inc I say, and incidents well i've said it Thank before you. sorry bruce i've said it before and i'll say it again and then bruce could say something um uh i i, I went and took a picture of a, a, a thing at school at my kids school um and I've got an old phantom in the background and when i was there a couple of the a couple of kids one came up and says oh i've got a mavic it's much better than that and another one said oh i've got a p4p and and what my point there is is that in a generation's time or two it's all going to be standard anyway it's it's going to be that it's not going to be anything unusual to see uh, our paths used on building sites or around and about people are going to know they survey their roads and they're just going to become more accepted we're just at so one of these technology points and actually ian alluded it right to it right at the top with the cell phone industry you're at a point of integration and knowledge will come and we're just we're just at that point i think i think we're just going to hold tight and hope that not too many crazy regulations are put in that can't be undone and in fact in a lot of ways as you know i've said it before i don't think that um this is the biggest threat i think the biggest uh, threat to us all is drone deliveries but that's another topic altogether i must say hello to chris i force 2d come on chris come on we want you on people are asking for you hurry up <laughs> i don't know if you will but yeah that's my anyway rant over oh you your turn to rant bruce sorry oh, okay um i can see how they're coming across with this you know we want you to register so you can sit and examine and prove that you know the rules that's fine that's that's what we do with driver licensing i mean you've got to go and you've got to sit a theory test and things but if i got everyone here today and got you to sit the driver's test the theory test you set when you first got your license how many of you think you would pass that test it's a single snapshot in time and it's oh don't be smart oh, <laughs> <laughs> and so it, it, it the fact that you drive your car every day safely even though you may not know all the rules shows that there's a much better way to make things safe and it's not to just roll out the rules and say you must do this you must not do that you must do this you've got to show people why the rules exist you've got to teach them the the reasons for doing things and that's something that's totally missed they say you must not fly above 400 feet everyone goes why you must not fly within one kilometer of an airport why instead of saying these are the um ironclad rules you've got to try and get the culture of safety and understanding of why things are important and that's where most of the regulators haven't done a really good job so you get people flying their planes on the approach past the international airport they don't understand why it's not a good thing because surely the planes will see their drones and fly around them they don't understand the, the, the facts and that's where i think regulators are looking from you know a lot of book learning desk pilots they don't understand the human psychology hasn't been taken into account and we've really got to focus on that the other thing i wanted to mention is insurance now canada was leading the way by its, its plan to its, its new regulations were planning to make sure everyone had to have compulsory insurance and they've just dropped that because they realize that no insurer is going to provide insurance at an affordable level and even if they do provide insurance if you're going to do the things that are going to cause problems i.e outside the regulatory framework then you're not going to be covered anyway because insurers will say sorry you're breaking the law you're not covered so is insurance really going to be as essential as uh, as you might think it is because canada have dropped it well, the bloke, the bloke that spoke after, he, he wanted registration because he was from the insurance industry. He was desperate for our money, desperate, desperate, desperate for our money, and it was uh, I, I couldn't stand it. Even for me personally, for me myself and I, if insurance has to come, I would rather it came through something like the uh, AMA in America, BMFA in uh, England, and the New Zealand Model Flyers Association. A bit controversial, Bruce, because I'm sure they all have. Um, insurance schemes and that comes with a little bit of training so if you're going to buy insurance 
get get it from people that are going to give you uh, a model aircraft uh, association that's going to give you a, a little bit of training as well uh, that goes along with it insurance just for insurance sake yes if it's a legal requirement then i guess i have to have it but it doesn't i don't learn anything from it and of course that was the great thing with the us registration thing wasn't it was it eight dollars bruce that original but that was coming that was coming with education when you registered your drone over there you were getting education and it wasn't it six lines or something like don't hit things be good it was something like that wasn't it? um i don't know anyone yeah anyone else's thought on insurance um i've yeah, got I, I agree with your insurance generally I've got a general point, which actually brings in uh, fill it nicely as well. Um, with regulation with drones, one thing it's not taken into account um, is, is the fact that it's always a moving target in that drones are becoming safer by the year. I mean, I remember when I was flying my first drone, it was, oh, well, first one was a Phantom. In fact, I think I had the world's first Phantom fly away at some RC group, so I'm gonna I'm gonna claim that. Um, but after that, I had the DJI uh, F550. Um, that was a flight control. I think it's single IMU um, GPS unit that wasn't particularly good. I don't think it had a, uh, a saw in that. I don't, you know, I, don't, I think it was prone to noise, and certainly there was issues with the compass. And so we got the thing of flyaways. And and over the years, and in fact, I can bring another prop now. There we go, green cube of uh, Philips there. Uh, but yet the technology now, the fact that we've got you know three IMUs in that, and redundancy now is part and parcel of drone design. You know, even with your your latest D DJI drones, your uh, your Mavic Air, you know, you've got um, a lot of collision sensors. Uh, again, we're going yeah, we're going smaller, lighter, and and uh, safer. And none of the regulations uh, are even considering the fact that every year the drones themselves, the manufacturers, are putting in lots of levels of extra safety. Um, and, and the other thing as well is uh, an industry, everything's thought about from um, just the aviation viewpoint, but that isn't just a factor here with drones. Drones are effectively flying computers, and there's no expertise that seems to be out there considering that factor which is equally as important in that the software is every bit as important on the safety of a drone and yet we have manufacturers just churning out firmware after firmware firmwares are going out with bugs in them and then quickly pushing out another one it, it, if it's a piece of software on my desktop and you're doing that it doesn't matter but when you're flying something about it does matter people think you know you hear it all the time i'll switch to manual there isn't any true thing as manual with your quadcopter because it's still the software flying it. You're just changing to a mode where it's using less sensors. So there's an, a, a total gross naivety there, and that's going all the way up to the regulators. So that I mean, you know, I'm hearing commercial operators saying my drone has crashed today, showing pictures of it, and then you know another half dozen will chip in. Yeah, that, that's a known problem. Thinking, well, this is a known problem. Why is why has no one sent a log file to the manufacturer? Why hasn't this been fixed? And there's none of that good software behavior in, in the industry. So that's just another rant of, rant of mine there. But I think, <laughs> but I think we're missing some of the aspects that actually should be a lot more important. Certification. Well, uh, on, on that one, we had an interesting one in Australia. Um, the particular names of the regulators involved will remain silent, but... Uh, a friend of mine was at a barbecue with a bunch of uh, people from CASA and he pulled out uh, one of my personal drones that he had, which had a, uh, had a cube in it, and uh, he went to arm it and it wouldn't arm. Um, rather embarrassing. Um, this thing wouldn't take off. It just refused to take off. And uh, they said, oh, well, clearly a bad drone because it didn't take off. And he turned around and said, so what do you say with an aircraft? It's, it's better to have, you know, air above you, you know, and, and want to be in the air than, than, you know, air below you and want to be on the ground. Um, at the end of the day, things do go wrong, and it's about how you handle what goes wrong that, that really matters. And you, you're right, the industry is really lacking um, that the, the most important thing is the, the UX, how, how the user experiences the product and, getting it in the air efficiently and 
easily is is so much more important. And uh, we get complaints all the time. Oh, the drone won't take off. So what do they do? They go into the software, they hack it out, and they turn all the pre-arm checks off. Then they go flying, they crash, and they turn around and say, Phil, your autopilot crashed my drone. And they send me the log, and the first thing I notice is pre-arm's turned off, and I say, I'm sorry, you're an idiot. And then they say, you're not very good at PR. And I say, I'm an engineer. I'm not meant to be good at PR. So get over it. Um, th these things are there for your safety. And the Archer Pilot team puts so much effort into safety. And the crashes we see are people that are pushing the envelope, which is fine. We encourage pushing the envelope if they're not going to complain about crashing. But when they go on a rant and a rave and they crash or they fly over people and they've got arming checks set to zero, it's like... Come on, guys, this is just bad for the industry. Like, some common sense from our own people is probably the most important thing before we expect common sense from regulators. Actually, yeah. I can vouch for the Argent Pilot whole firmware because I've been using it for a number of years now, and every crash I've had with a plane or copter equipped with that thing has been mainly... Uh, like a mistake I've made during construction or like a programming decision or something like that. That being said, I have turned off the pre-flight checks on some of the models I have because on a plane, for me, it is absolutely ridiculous to absolutely need to use a compass module. So on one of my fixed folks, I disabled the compass completely and the KFM free filter, whatever that, Thing is latest version kept yapping on about needing a compass so i solved that problem guess what still flies pretty good even with pre pre-arm checks turned off and no compass even with the kfm pre filters screaming like mad to <laughs> fly that something's you know the plane can, can i please ask that in the future you just mask out just the compass and leave the rest of the arming checks okay yes the plane uh, will fly quite well with the compass I've never really spent all that much time re reading through all the uh, <laughs> options there. I just disabled all of them. And just while I have the word, Philip, ever since I joined, I've been eyeballing that one third of a plane on your ceiling. What is that? That is a, uh, th this one over here? Yeah. Yeah, look, Big that's a, a retro that I uh, bought from uh, good old Hobby King. Many, many years ago. Yeah. It cost me a hundred yeah, bucks. They don't sell it how anymore. How many? And it's in such good condition that I'm not game to actually fly it ever. Late. End of last year, I bought one of these brand new in a box, shipped it from France for 300 euros. <laughs> yeah, I'm negotiating. They're awful. They're it's awful. very pretty. Yeah, negotiated with, negotiated with some guy. Finally, settled on a price and he shipped it it's been sitting in its box ever since because i just don't have the time to get around to it but i'm planning on equipping and flying it just gonna take some time to gather the parts <laughs> because nothing i have that, except for the motor perhaps is gonna fit that thing <laughs> that one's actually got an apm 2.6.2 in it um that's that's how long ago i built it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm probably going to put some sort of a pixel in there. You yeah. mean you mean something like uh, this? Look at that. Oh, is that a, that's a two, is it? That's is a two. I'm... That's a two. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's a two. The History Channel presents. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was going to ask, um, jump, jump into the topic. While well, we've got Philip here, um, yeah. maker of the cube, um, so I've got um, on, I, want, I did one. This is this is the one of the beta ones. You very kindly sent. I want an award for the world's worst dual GPS setup, um, the world's worst placement. Um, <laughs> this Chibios, I don't even know how to say it. Now, yep. is this really going to be a uh, three three IMUs? So now it can use them properly or something. Can you explain that for dummies, i.e., me? Okay. Well, um, th so. <laughs> Basically, there's there's a lot of push at the moment for faster um, processors and things like that to be able to um, get more cool stuff happening on your autopilots. And um, 
And then along comes a toy company that wants heap a drone and fit the all the code into a much uh, smaller chip. And that was proving very difficult to do the way we were doing it. Um, Argypilot runs on an operating system called NutX at the moment. And NutX is really inefficient. Um, and there's probably not a, a nice way to say that, so just be blunt. Um, it's it's an amazing thing. It's a it's sort of a Linux like operating system, so it's really 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 super efficient for what it is, but it's too inefficient for what we need it to be. And uh, yeah, some of the guys were working on a thing called Chibios, which we're actually using in our CAN bus devices. So the CAN GPS will be coming out soon. Actually, has um, some stuff in it uh, from that. Uh, also, the ESCs that have been around for a while, uh, CAN ESCs has been running Chibios. And it's just super lean operating system um, and a lot more efficient. So basically, when the port to Argy Pilot was done to Chibios, the intention was to make it take less flash. The effect is that we're actually using less processor. Um, so at the moment, with a Pixel 2, if you're running it on, um, on the current Argy Pilot, you can run two EKFs, um, which can have their own sensor uh, set to them. We have three lots of IMUs on the um, on the cube, and so that means if one of those fails for whatever reason, and to be blunt, we use mobile phone sensors in these autopilots. They're you know a couple of dollars for each sensor. They are not military spec. They are not aerospace uh, spec sensors, and they do fail, and they're to be expected to fail. Um, so when they fail with a second EKF, it just goes, oh, yeah, I'll switch over to the other one. You continue flying. Next time you go to start, it'll give you a, an arming check failure, assuming you've got your arming check not set to zero. Um, and you won't take off the next time and you've got a broken item, buy another one, claim it under warranty, whatever. Um, but you're safe. You haven't crashed. So... That's great, except we've got three of these things and we we obviously want to run uh, all three. Under Chibios, we can run all three. We can do a whole bunch of other things as well and we're still using bugger all of the processor. Um, it's so efficient now that the processor is spending a heap of time just sitting there idle now. Um, so now we have all these new processors coming out, which means we can um, idle twice as fast. Um, or four times as fast, depending on which process you use. We've got two new models coming out soon that'll idle you really well, but they won't actually achieve much more for you than just idling. So again, I'm being a really bad salesman when we release our next cube because uh, it's <laughs> it's not really necessary yet. Um, so you know, there's a big push from another software group that do open source autopilots. Um, and they need it because they're still running NutX. They're running a less efficient scheduler. And so the way they do things, they, they can use the triple redundancy on the uh, IMUs, but what they do is they get all the data from the IMUs, they blend it together, then they run it to the EKF. Now, unfortunately, if you do that, the EKF is actually always a little bit behind reality in the way it does things, and it estimates forward to reality. The problem is if you've got three lots of data coming in that are fused together, and one lot of data is actually completely haywire. It's like scrambled eggs in there, and you can't de-scramble that egg after it gets into the EKF, after it's too late. Um, so by running one EKF, you actually have no redundancy. You just have an <laughs> average of noise. Um, and um, someone told me a while ago that an average of good and bad is not better. It's bad. <laughs> Um, whereas if you've got good, good, bad, and you eliminate bad, you've still got good. Um, so now another thing, another thing. I'm, I'm going to stop you there because I'm getting bored. No, I'm, <laughs> no, 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 no. Before I forget, so I was going to say, what, what about if I, what about if I take one of these GPS and put it on the up, up, upside down? On the underside of this, because most of my aircraft spend their, their life in this attitude, and um, so so would that work? And would that allow me to then perhaps do a mission upside down, perhaps with my camera on the top? So when I when I come into land, I flip it back over. Could I do that? 
Uh, yes, you, you can do that. So if you use the blending function, you, you can do that. Now, um, basically, the autopilot will pick the best uh, GPS solution that's matched in with the EKF. Um, the only trick being that depending on your wing, if you've got no lock on the bottom one, because you might have a pretty, pretty good wing that's shielding a lock, and you've got no lock, when you turn upside down, mm. it's still going to take a little while to get a lock. Um, so I had to fly a knife edge for a while, and then... Knife edge for a while, get a lock, and then go over. Um, but your average foamy, even if it's upside down, you're going to get a lock. It just won't be great. So, yeah, it, it would work. Um, there are people actually doing that in commercial applications. So there are people flying RG plane then that are flying with a camera pointing up at takeoff, i.e. protected, then flying along, flipping it over, doing its funky stuff, and then that would be... I'm not sure if I'm quite brave enough to have a go at that. And then how... Uh, is that just a flick of a switch or is that a command to flip it over? That, there's actually a, a do invert command in missions. So that was actually introduced in 2014 for the, uh, the Spark Fun Advanced Vehicle Challenge. Um, or automated vehicle, however, whatever that, ABC, um, which we managed to win, which was really cool on an aircraft that didn't actually use that function because the aircraft that used that function crashed just before the competition um, due to a dodgy uh, battery lead. But anyway, um, and so basically the intention was that we'd, we'd fly out, do the mission and get over the target area and invert to drop the uh, ball, fly the rest of the mission inverted and then flip over for landing just... Really, we were going for comedy value. Um, we weren't expecting to win the competition. We just wanted to do something a bit weird and wacky. And, um, yeah, so Andrew Trigel introduced um, Do Invert as a mission item. Um, and it just flies. If your aircraft's capable of inverting, you can fly your mission inverted, no problem. Yeah, a bit of fun. But yeah, I mean, you could protect your antennas. You could, well, you could, yes, because then when your antennas are... Uh, when you're inverted, if your antennas are on the top, they're going to have a better view of the ground. That's what I was thinking then, trying to think yeah. aloud. And then you need to protect them when you come up. Can I ask yep. something on the point of Chivios, whatever that thing is? Uh, do you have yep. any knowledge if that means that now the uh, flight controllers like the Mini 6 from Radio Link are supported in the standard mission planner? thingy all these still need to use their own version of the software because last information i read somewhere was that the people from radio link were working with the rg pilot team on getting that thing integrated in there because they were using actually the thing is they were using some sensor quite a bit differently from the rest of the boards and the gps uh, module used this a slightly different compass so they needed to do their own version of the code um, yeah, look, unfortunately, when a, when a um, clone company turns up and decides to um, reinvent the wheel and code doesn't work, they love to jump up and down and blame the team. Um, if it actually involved people from the team in the first place and, you know, ask the no, questions they don't, or they don't provide blame anyone. early. No, they don't that? blame anyone. They just provided their own well, version of the code. They they did they did basically say you had to use this version because the the full version wouldn't work. But the reason it didn't work is because they didn't actually supply their patches. So uh, I believe that's all been fixed now. But obviously um, uh, I'm biased in recommendations of boards, and uh, <laughs> others can comment there. But uh, I've never had a problem yeah, with the problem. I I. Uh, I have a very big problem when people call their boards names of other people's products. Um, I think that's just disgusting and dirty, but that's another topic altogether. Um, mm. If they wanted to call it an R, R Link pilot, like, you know, Hobby King built the, the HK32 pilot. It's clearly a Pixel clone, but they admit it. They call it a HK32 pilot. Uh, if Radio Link want to go, you know, Radio Link pilot 32, whatever, go for it. But to call it a Pixel, that's just scabby and scum to put it nicely and i'm being very polite um, companies like that disgust me um and i'm being extremely polite but um yeah they're running special code was their choice and you know i do believe that the patches are in there now to uh to be able to run their boards okay um yeah but, and, and to be fair it is 
the, the, the project is making a path of entry for people from low entry board to end up to more professional boards. Yep. So it's it's not a bad uh, a bad thing. Um, Chris is saying there was a bootloader, and then Chris is saying, oops, spoke too soon, that's wrong, but there's one around somewhere. So a definitive answer from iForce 2D there. Um, and then weflyanydrone.com. Um, Philip, if you have three... <laughs> Oops. Hello. Hello. Did we just lose him? We killed Gary. Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh, well, <they've> gone. <laughs> right, now we can really talk about important stuff. Right. Oh, did I go? Oh, I he's I back. Oh, he's back. Oh, yeah. I go. Oh. oh, he's back. Oh. Oh. Uh, if you have three sources of similar sensor data and those sensors start to return out of range data, then logic could choose to exclude the Uranus data. That, that is correct, and that's why you need to have the three EKFs running because if you run them into one EKF, uh, by the time you detect the data's wrong, it's actually too late. You've already poisoned your EKF and it's, and it's stuffed. Whereas if you run them into separate EKFs, the EKF that goes wrong will fall over really quickly. The good thing about the EKF is they're really fragile, so if you give them bad data, they fall to bits really quickly, and that's ironically a really good thing because we know it's bad so we can uh, eliminate it and switch to a good one um so yeah the advantage of, of having that and you don't actually want three zero if you can help it so on the on the um two isolated imus and one non-isolated imu and of the two isolated imus one's an st micro um sensor and the other one's from um invent sense um, so they actually operate in different ways. So they have different failure modes. So the, the same fault shouldn't cause the same failure mode. Um, and now I'm nerding out. You're the king of that. The absolute king. Look, we've, <laughs> and, and we thank you for it because I don't understand a word of it. <laughs> As he stopped speaking, uh, <laughs> it's, look, we've gone half an hour over already. Yeah, I should, I should be asking. I knew this would go long. I should be asking, has anyone else seen anything else this week that's caught their attention? It was just the helicopter drone incident in Switzerland and the one in the UK in Devon. Oh, oh, it oh you didn't? Oh, that yeah. one! No, yeah, I saw that, and that was that was the coppers. That was the Rosses. <laughs> if you can't trust the police to fly in the with it, you know, actually, the police were within the rules, weren't they? It was the F fifteen pilot was below four hundred feet or something, three hundred feet. I think the incident occurred at, according to the BBC report. Yeah, they can go for low flying. I think they can go down to about two hundred and fifty meters, and and that happens over a lot of the UK. It, it's uh, it was. It's, oh, sorry, two hundred fifty feet. Even two hundred fifty feet, and it's actually down to seventy five feet in some places, especially where he was, uh, where they were heading uh, on Dartmoor. Um, that's that's probably one of the areas they were heading. But yeah, but that, actually, that was that was actually quite a good, um, an, another example of, um, of of approved operators in the UK actually. If, if they have it because it was the police that said hang on a minute these f-15s went past so yes the media have blown that out of all proportion really and it's actually it takes us all the way back to the beginning because it's a really actually, it's a good story because the, the the police operator said oh that was a bit close best we tell someone the CIA said oh yes well thanks very much and both sides have been made aware of what was going on so i, I thought it was actually good report uh, good reporting on on the behalf on behalf of the police operators your honor honest it is Actually, in the latest Victor magazine by CAA here in New Zealand. There's a, an article which shows that a great number of GA pilots are simply not following the rules, and they're causing incidents <gasps> with commercial drone operators who are following the rules. And it's time for a culture change. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do it. In the case of those F-15 pilots, you know, yeah, we can fly down to 75 feet, but is it really the smartest thing to do now that there are drones all over the place? You've really got to. Wow. You know, the whole culture has to change. Don't, don't well no no ga below 2k that's what i say um that actually confirms my theory and i think i've shared this with you a while back that actually most incidents if not every incident is going to occur very close to the ground by uh manned planes just flying too low i don't think we're gonna see anybody hitting anything at two three four five kilometers high in the air and i think that's where it will be safe to be with a drone well, 
Yes, yes, but I mean, it, yeah, don't I've don't get. I've never seen a plane up there. Plenty down low to the ground, though. Like almost every time we go to the uh, flying field, we usually visit out of the city. There's this guy, and he constantly flies by like 10, 10 meters off the ground, close to us. And he knows we're flying drones. And last time was like a week ago, and there were two planes in the air and the race squad. And I think it was just chance he didn't hit something because he made two passes over our heads. Okay. I think he's gone again. <laughs> Did you report him? Gone. Did you report him to the authorities? <laughs> Somebody must have snapped his internet connection. Yes. Oh, yes. Man. Have I gone? You actually still yeah, you are gone again. I'm gone. Am I not here anymore? <laughs> Nobody can see you. <laughs> There's no one here. Well, that's a perfect time. Did anyone else? Did anyone else have anything else that they have seen this week that they'd like to talk about? Going once. Uh, all we got to say Ian's face. <laughs> yeah, that's a we very did. rare thing. Oh, it's oh been I, you search the internet for Ian, and you will never see a picture of him. This oh is, yes, this that's is a true. Very rare privilege for everyone. Wait, wait, I'm going to screen grab this. Hold on. <laughs> how, is, how is, it, is, it? <laughs> is it really him? Um, and we fly any drone.com. Could someone share a link to the official news regarding the DFT material, please? It's There's out no tomorrow. Reason. There is there is no official link because you heard it first on, well, Facebook and SUS News. Uh, yes. Oh, I did want to say uh, that, uh, Daryl, you run approved drone pilots. What is that about? Tell us quickly your elevator pitch. Go. It's, it's a, co a community of uh, CAA approved PFCO holders, uh, which basically is a portal for people to find us. Um, there's, there's currently the CAA website. You can go to to find lists of uh, of uh, PFCO holders, but there's no searchable database online. So we've um, been authorised by the CAA to list all the PFCO holders. So now there's a, 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 a portal for any commercial or any um, any person looking to hire a commercial operator to go to to check to, uh, number one to check to see if someone's on on there. And number two, to find um, a registered member um, and be able to identify if they're suitable for a job through, um, they'll have some portfolio images on there, some bio uh, videos. But it's just a quick, convenient way to find an official licensed well, licensed pilot in the UK. But as I say, uh, it's also a, a, a portal for people to go and check uh, that someone is actually on the register. So if you think someone's flying illegally, uh, operating as a, a commercial pilot when they shouldn't be. Um, if you get their details or get the company name, you can go onto the site, you can quickly type that in, and it will quickly reference the CAA database. Splendid. Well, that's good. You've got your elevator pitch in. Nicola, what's on the build table for you? And I enjoyed the <laughs> Trigger's broom reference. Thank you very much. <laughs> Actually, uh, trust me, you don't want to see my build table this week because there's, like everything you can imagine except planes and copters because i'm doing some renovation now in my workshop as well and it is a nightmare in there so i i've got some material for one or two more videos and i'm hoping to be done with that ordeal by then oh but this is gonna be a tough week and probably next <laughs> one so uh don't say anything uh concrete just one more video about the ranger g2 uh some endurance test and i might be able to handle something at the beginning of next week if I can't do any flying over the weekend. But <laughs> you know, finishing that work workshop is a priority right now. It's a yeah, I kind of need to do that. Ian, what's uh, what, who are you going to be bothering with this week with the freedom of information requests? Um, well, I'm going to give it a rest for this week because I've already got um, about 10 to come back, so I'll wait for those to come back. I did try one to the, the EU, but they told me to get stuff because apparently what I was asking for is confidential. Um, so there are, there are a few exceptions that you can't ask for, unfortunately. But I'll, I'll, 
I'll, I'll keep digging and encourage other people to do it so we get more facts out to, um, to the drone community. And just whilst I'm speaking here at the end, I'll just give one quick plug for uh, Philip because drone uh, clones came up earlier. And, and I know people always want to buy the cheapest, uh, so we'll buy clone hardware. But Philip's online, I see him virtually every single day helping people at all hours. You simply can't buy that kind of support. So support his products. He knows what he's talking about. This guy, speaking to him, has told me how you put a GPS together. So I know what each component on there does. He's a, he's a, a minefield of uh, information. Or just a minefield. I think I prefer to think of him as a minefield. I think. I think that's what I prefer to think. Yeah. And Philip, um, military matters. How's the Harrier? Oh, uh, how? Which one? We've got three now. Three. So, um, are they all are they jewels Dave, and singles? Uh, so uh, yeah, we've got uh, Dave from Advanced VTOL Tech in uh, here in Ballarat who owns them. Uh, we've got a uh, T4, which is a trainer. Uh, we've got the T3, which is a single seat, and we've just got the Sea Harrier, which is um, pretty Ooh. nice in eight, 850 hours or thereabouts on the airframe. So, um, which, which squadron was the which, which, uh, which boat was the Sea Harrier from? I used to see the them a lot. Just came out from um, from the UK. Um, I'm not really familiar with its history yet, but it was in a collection that an old bloke had, so it was hangered and in very good condition. Um, so it's getting some. Uh, it's probably going to get some Pixel 2 cubes fitted to it um, to do some monitoring in flight um, and also potentially for um, supplying uh, pilot information to the HUD. So, um, but you, yeah. that's three. How many aircraft make a squadron? We're talking about real Harriers here, people. Real sitting <laughs> and going forward Harriers. So, I mean, you almost Look, got a squadron. You know, back just before the, uh, that little incident down in, near Argentina. Uh, Australia was meant to be getting a aircraft carrier and a bunch of uh, Harriers, and that sort of fell to bits when that incident happened. And um, so we're just trying to make up for it now. Finally, wow. Australia and the Air Force. So. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. don't go down there. <laughs> and then, and and then, autopilot news. Is there anything we should be looking out for in the next Look, week or so? I, I did want to have a bit of a mention, like uh, Ian did on on clones, um, but nothing to do with anything I build. Um, I wanted to give a plug out for Rum Trappy and the TBS Crossfire. Um, there are companies that are causing him grief. And, um, you know, let's just leave it there. But well, the I, I, are you referring to companies that would be suggesting that he's, he's stolen their technology when in actual fact his technology came out before their technology? That sort of a thing, for instance. Yeah, yeah. And um, it's... It's, it's a really difficult game to be in, the hardware game. Um, it's, you, you involve yourself with the community. You do things at, at a rate. You work with the community to get things to a point that the community wants it. You're designing it the way they need it. Um, it's, it's not necessarily the way you want it. I can tell you that the cube would be very different if I was designing it just for me versus what the rest of the community needs. Um, and... The, the same trappies put a lot of effort into getting things just right and um, to a level that people can just trust his gear um, and to have other companies come along and claim that it's theirs and blah, 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 blah mm. and to come mm. out with stuff competing with it that just copies it. Um, I, I know people don't quite understand the angst that uh, some people have with it, but um, it's, it's just uh, such damage to the industry um in our ability to actually bring better products in the future you know we're not we're not big nokias and intels and we're, we're not big companies and we're just you know single man bands that try and get things working and, and help the community and and yeah so you know when mm. you're buying stuff mm. and you're looking for good stuff you know get get the good stuff um, I'm, I'm quite amazed that more people aren't picking up the fact that that's got with a soft simple software upgrade it's got flam capabilities and then your utm your aircraft is you're already buying that system anyway and then for a little upgrade you've got utm built yep. in as well um i'm amazed that 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 isn't flying and, off the shelf for that very reason if you're using this if you're using this and you're using the flam system in that and you happen to have a ping connected to your to your uh, pixel compatible autopilot um, with Archie Pilot running, you've got 
everything covered pretty much on the, the current system. Yeah. So yeah. if we want to go back to what we really should be doing to avoid aircraft, if people are commercially flying and they are flying legitimately near airports and, you know, in areas where um, F-15s could be flying, um, we actually have collision avoidance as a standard feature within Pilot with the ADS-B and, you know, the, the fact well, of the matter is that the F-15s F- F- would have had their transponders turned on. Um, so, yeah. Well, they, 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 yeah, that is an interesting... In the UK, a lot of aircraft are... Royal Air Force aircraft are fitted with FLAM because there's lots of gliding activity in the LFAs and that's so the gliders know that way, but the American military stuff wouldn't be seen because that doesn't have it. They're just up there. Up. Anyway, that's all all, all by the by. <laughs> Um, there's lots of nuances, but again, no GA below 2K, and they've all got to have ADSB. I'm making friends everywhere with that. Um, Bruce, let's just jump to Bruce. Bruce, what's what's on the build? Where's the balloon? Come on, Bruce, get the balloon out. I'm waiting for the weather, the wind. Hopefully tomorrow will be just right, so we might get it away tomorrow. That'll be great. And uh, in the meantime, I'm just flying outlaw, showing people that uh, the rules don't necessarily mean safety and Flying safely doesn't necessarily mean that you're complying with the rules. Big risk, but I'm taking it, and uh, so far, so good. And uh, one of the panel here, I know, they didn't want their picture spread around the internet. Well, too late. Look, look. I've got it. <laughs> wow. That's like... <laughs> That's going you, on Facebook. Do you work for the courts? Are you Are you the yeah. bloke that does yeah. the pictures yeah. in the courts? Wow. That's amazing. Balls. I'll render it in 3D later. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and don't forget to add some um, some crypto, um, uh, some blockchain, blockchain and yeah. uh, some AI. Artificial intelligence. <laughs> oh, yes. Did we also, oh, too late to mention it, really. Did you all see that little thing come out of Switzerland? World's smallest AI drone. Yeah. Not a load of nonsense. Yeah. I haven't bothered reporting that. Anyway, look, with that, I'm going to say thank you very, very much, gentlemen. We have run very, very far over time, an hour and 45 uh, this evening. Very interesting indeed. Bruce Chain, yes, Bruce, you're right. And sorry you didn't get the house. Uh, Chris and Jamie, sorry you didn't go down to the pub. Lee, we look forward to seeing your reports. And thanks very much to everybody else that joined us. So thanks very much, everybody. Don't forget, join us again, 2100 GMT next week. And next week, we are having... Uh, Kyle from Skydio, who's coming to talk to us. Hello, what's he saying there? What's that? What's what's uh, what shameless, that, plug. shameless plug? Hang on, I've got a plug here somewhere. Um, <laughs> what's it? What's it a plug for? Show me that. Show me the plug. You've got to go a bit more. You've got to be a bit. More. Yeah, closer. Then talk. If you talk, it will come up full screen. All right. There we are. Oh, creative oh, sky on, on. Oh, I see it's your card. I'll put a link. I'll put a link in below to his company or a company of a very similar name, and that'll annoy him no end. Um, <laughs> I'm sure I can find one. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much, everybody. Yeah, Skydio next week, and whoever else we can rustle up. Have a lovely, safe week. Uh, great flying weekend if you're doing that sort of a thing. We'll see you all then. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.